Vincent Schilling is the executive vice president and co-owner of Schilling Media, a Native American-owned media and media relations corporation in the state of Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia. Vincent is an enrolled um, Akwanasani Mohawk, and I'm so sorry about my mispronunciation, an award-winning Native American author and an award-winning photojournalist as well as a motivational and diversity public speaker who has traveled all over the U.S. and Canada. And with that, we look forward to what you have to share. Great. Sego, Jogalis Giga, Zatakolitika. My name is Vincent Schilling, and uh, my native name is Black Raven. And uh, hmm. I am Akwasasne Mohawk, and uh, you did pretty good. Uh, as far as pronunciation, <laughs> but it's Aquasasne Mohawk, and Aquasasne is actually the part of my reserve, uh, which is based in Canada and the United States. And Aquasasne actually is distinct uh, in that uh, we sit on the uh, border of Canada and the United States. So my tribe is actually Canadian, United Statesian, and Indian. So uh, I just made that up, didn't really work. <laughs> but, um, and I am also a vegan and I've been a vegan for about 20 years. And uh, there is not a lot of uh, veganism in Indian country, uh, although there are some. Uh, and I've done considerable amount of research on, you know, uh, plant-based diets and, and uh, plant-rich diets in Indian history, Native American history, and uh, found a lot of really kind of interesting things in that Native Americans actually, uh, and this is a rough estimate, but the estimate is about um, one half of the vegetation, one half of the vegetables that we have here were cultivated by Native Americans. So it's hard to believe that, uh, you know, the way we are kind of dictated in television, movies, etc. is, you know, all we did was eat every part of the buffalo, you know, and live in a teepee and ride a horse. And, and, uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, we were very strongly, uh, many, many tribes were very strongly um, agriculturalists. Uh, and, um, you know, many tribes actually considered uh, hunting was even just a little bit of a hobby more so uh, living on vegetation. And, um, you know, so I thought about, um, about talking to you guys tonight. And I, I really want to say thank you very much uh, for s some of your time. Um, I'm honored that you would uh, take a few, few uh, moments out of your day to listen to what I have to say. And, um, I'm honored by that and you honor me. And uh, I appreciate you for that. So I sat, you know, um, thinking for the past couple of days after uh, meeting with some of the great folks, Ellie and, and um, you know, uh, we talked about some questions that you guys might ask and I was telling them that I could put some slides together. And um, the more and more I thought about it, the more and more it kept sounding very presentational and like I'm giving a speech and I'm, and I thought of my, my grandfathers and I thought of my grandmother and I thought of my culture. And um, there is one thing about a lot of native culture and please let me say, uh, initially that I do not represent every native person. I represent myself. Um, I represent myself as best I can. Uh, uh, what I say uh, may or may not resemble what another native person may or may not say. So I just like to say that out of respect for someone else's beliefs, etc. But, but I thought about my experience and um, You know, Native people are storytellers. So I thought I would tell my story and I thought I would tell some stories that maybe you hadn't or hadn't heard. And, um, you know, 
some of it is tied to veganism and some of it is tied to my native culture and it is Native American Heritage Month. And, uh, you know, I really, really genuinely mean I'm honored by you folks listening. I, mean, I really mean that. I'm, I'm like, I'm profoundly honored by it and humbled. I really thank each and every one of you um, sincerely from the bottom of my heart. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about me, a little bit of my, about my family history and the Native American history and um, the kind of struggle uh, that some Native folks have gone through in a sense that I'd like to help create some sense of empathy and thought processes towards our nation's indigenous people and native people. And, um, you know, my grandmother, I'll start out by saying something I want to, to honor of my grandmother, my dota is what I would say, um, was a victim of residential schools, um, the Canadian boarding schools and residential schools, which means she was at a very, very young age taken to a school against the will of her family. And uh, my great grandmother, who didn't speak English at all, who only spoke Mohawk, tried to get her back. And the nurse, the uh, nuns had said something to the effect of, you know, you have to have a job, this and that, that you have your daughter back. So she went and did all this, came back. And they're like, you sign your daughter over, you can't have her back. They literally would not give her back. So my great grandmother um, uh, went back in the middle of the night, broke in and stole her daughter's back. And I say the word stole, but it's her daughter, but took her daughter and my grandmother's sister back. So when my grandmother came of age to have children, she became panic stricken, moved uh, to California and fled the reservations so quickly that a lot of people were like, whatever happened to your grandmother, we never knew. And took all her children, fled because she was so afraid that her children were gonna get taken. So it is part of Mohawk and many native cultures to raise your children by the grandparents. And we would have long houses that would be added to as a family member added. So whole families would live together, all entire families. And I was raised many, many parts of my young childhood by my grandmother. And part of my Mohawk culture is we teach each other or our children, our, our children, our infants, our babies, our Mohawk language, our Mohawk traditions, our Mohawk songs. And my grandmother never uttered one word of Mohawk to me. My grandmother never sang one song to me that was Mohawk. My grandmother never shared one tradition with me because she was so frantic and so terrified that someone would know I was an Indian and I could be taken from her. And that is the level of genocidal, cultural genocide that has infiltrated native people for generations. And some of the relationships with native people and food is based on absolute survival. That same sense, I'm, I'm trying to share with you that sense of desperation that my grandmother felt to keep me protected. And this same sort of desperation has existed in generation after generation in so many native cultures because what would happen is many times when native people were moved off their lands and forced to re reserves or forced to live around army forts um you know they were literally starving because the soldiers would kill things around them they would destroy or move them to areas that were in hospitable for plants to grow. So native people would surround the forts in hopes to get food. So they would hand them things like, you know, sugar, uh, lard and bread or, or, or flour. So they would make fry bread out of that. And, um, and this is something a little disturbing. I'm not trying to get too icky, but soldiers would pee in the sugar and harden it and give it to the kids as candy. 
like this was some of the just just some of the meanness of of people but but the reason i'm explaining this is because native people have always tried to survive at any cost so here they were starving and being given flour lard sugar um and it saved their life so one time my wife's mother said to me you know when i first got it it saved my life but now it's killing me you know so if you look at tribes and i've looked at some of the history um, one tribe that came to mind during my research was the choctaw and there was a uh, native woman writer who wrote of uh, some of the personal accounts of some of these soldiers uh, running into the Choctaw and the the people saying, the soldiers saying, wow, everything here is plant-based. The clothing was cotton and, and uh, other types of fabrics made from plants. And they had, um, you know, bean squash and pumpkin stews and, um, very, very, very little hunting at all. It was a very large um, vegetable and plant-based society at that time, a very, very gre gregarian. And, and um, so I think a lot of, of, of um, based upon not, not knowing the real history, because I remember talking to a woman one time and said, hi, when I first went vegan about 20 years ago, and I said, I asked a fellow, I said, was there any tribes that, that were, you know, largely plant? And she immediately was like, no, 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 no. And I just found that really hard to believe that, um, you know, plants did not play a stronger role. So I did a lot of my own research and I found that, yes, I mean, agriculturally, uh, Native people were huge in the ag agricultural world. And which brings up something I was talking with you guys a couple of days ago when we were, were talking about this talk tonight is how intrinsically important, um, you know, the three sisters are to the Iroquois Confederacy. And I don't know how many of you have heard of the three sisters. Uh, maybe some of you have or haven't. Uh, the, the, Three sisters are corn, beans, and squash. And, you know, perhaps you heard, and, and there are lots of stories about the three sisters, about how they work together, and, came, and it's a really sense of community. And what a, some people don't know is the symbiotic union that they have when they are planted together. So the Iroquois Confederacy, my own ancestors, my grandfathers and grandfathers' grandfathers, would plant corn, beans, and squash with one corn seed, uh, one corn grain, um, one squash seed, and, and one bean. Put it into one hole and plant them. And so what would happen is the corn stalk would grow, the beans would wrap around the corn stalk, and then the squash plants would have, would have the leaves at the bottom that would cause weeds not to grow. And this was this perfect symbiotic union of three plants growing together that would profoundly help each other. And it's that same sense of community in native communities that when we come together, we can be stronger, you know? So for me, uh, about 20, and this is my personal vegan story um, and why I decided to, to turn plant-based and become a vegan and, and um, about 20 years ago, <laughs> I uh, was sitting with my wife, Dolores, and, you know, we're eating, I think, beans, uh, rice and chicken or something. And I was just eating. I'm just going. I just was like not feeling it. You know, I was just like, I'm just <laughs> I said, I'm just I looked at her. And I just, you know, I'm just I'm just not feeling this right now. And she's like, yeah. And then we stopped. We decided, hey, let's just have vegetables and and just cheese. You know that whole we're, let's go vegetarian. We'll eat cheese and and um, everybody has their process. It's fine. You know, I understand. Uh, and eventually, we moved away from that. And I've been vegan for about twenty years now. Um, 
And, you know, I made the choice to become vegan. Uh, many parts of it was because of, you know, things like factory farming and uh, the terrible way in which animals are treated and, you know, chicken farms and things like that. And yes, of course, that was a huge part of it. Um, the other part was how I felt health wise, I felt great. And, um, you know, uh, I'm 53 years old and I, I feel fantastic. You know, um, I, 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 ever since I started going to be, I had more energy. I feel like I can go forever and ever, you know, and, and some of the things that you guys may or may not probably already realize. Um, but there was some emotional stuff that I don't see a lot of people talk about. And um, I do know as a native man and um, through a lot of my fellow native friends, we wear our emotions on our sleeves and we will say it straight out and whatever is in our thought process, we'll talk about it. And we will say things that people think, but don't ever say. It's, it's, it's something at least that I find for me in my friends and in native culture is just, we just, we just, we just say it, you know, uh, not trying to be rude, but like, just to say, Hey, look, you know, there, we don't like elephants in the living room. Let's talk about what needs to be talked about. So uh, I'll talk about the emotional journey a little bit that I don't hear talked about a lot in terms of what happens when you decide to go vegan. And for me, um, I knew it was the right thing to do, but when you start going in, maybe about, maybe about in the six months to a year in, you start to have those feelings of like, am I making the right decision? Cause I'm hungry, <laughs> you know? You know, or you're someone sitting next to you and they're having a cheeseburger or they're having like a, a cake, a piece of cake or, or, so, you know, you're just. And I and I started getting kind of mad, you know, because I was jealous that they had it so easy. And here I was making all these efforts to do the right thing. And I was looking at this guy who did this and and I didn't. I didn't want the food. I didn't want to, I didn't want to eat meat. I didn't want to eat cheese. I didn't want to, I didn't want to do those things because I really was glad I made that choice. But man, I was mad. I was like, how come, how come you just get to do this and it's tr troubleless for you? You can walk right up to the vending machine. You can buy whatever you want. You And I just was, I was irritated and I was mad and I had a bad attitude and so because they were doing this, I turned it around like, well, you don't understand. And then I turned into the angry vegan, who, the angry vegan who likes to cut everyone else down and you don't know how to live. You don't care about the animals. You don't care about the things that are going on at factory farms. Ha, ha, ha. I was hired and I was high and mighty. And I was looking down at people because really for me, and this is only my journey, I'm not saying anyone else, my journey was I was jealous and I was negative and I wasn't really honestly too fun to be around. You know, I I, uh, I just think, thank you, Stan, you gave me a comment, thank you, Stan. I, so I remember reading a, a book, I think it was uh, Healing with Whole Foods and it said, it's better to eat beer and Frank's with cheer and thanks than lentils and bread with fear and dread. And I was like, you know what? I am really a negative, not fun person to be around. And I think that's part of a lot of people's journey. I know for me, I, I just know it was for me. And I realized, I said, you know what? I can make some decisions myself to cheer up, <laughs> you know, and it's one thing if, if anyone is a new vegan or just starting, let me tell you something. There is a lot of homework you're going to have to do, but it gets easier. So for example, you go to Whole Foods market or you go to a, re a restaurant or you go to someplace. Now I'm, I'm, I even eat all organic. So let's add that to it. That's even more strict. But once you go to 
a grocery store and you find an item, you got to do a lot of label reading. But once you find that item that actually aligns with your ideals and your beliefs, and it's vegan and organic or whatever choice, and it works for you, and you even have to research what all these other ingredients are and what they are, once you find it, it goes on your shelf and it gets to stay there. So be, staying a vegan means you continually get to put more things on that shelf. And soon you're going to look over and your shelf's going to be huge and full and gorgeous. And I'll tell you, I don't get those weird, angry things anymore. I love being vegan. I really, really do enjoy it. I love the food I have. I love how creative I can be. Yeah, it gets to stay in your toolbox. Very good, Deanna. <laughs> exactly. So um, I, I, I am telling you all of this based upon my story and based upon some of the things about Native folks is the sense of having your ideals, your beliefs, your love for your fellow creatures and this and that, but also having empathy for your fellow man because not everyone is able to take our journey. And some people just won't. Even my friend who is a staunch meat eater says, man, he goes, you're probably gonna live a lot longer than me because you're vegan. He says, but that's just where I'm at. You know, and it's like, no matter how much you may want someone to turn or, or change or adjust, they're on their path. So I have found for me personally, it's more about living a life in a, energetic, positive, uh, open light way that is an attractive way to live that people are going to be like, Hey, what are you doing? How do you eat? What's the choices you make? Oh, wow. Really? I find if I live, uh, I, um, what's the program? The, uh, AA Alcoholics Anonymous says attraction rather than promotion. You know, so if I act in a way that is attractive to other folks or act in a way that is friendly to other folks, being a good role model, Amy, yes, exactly, then people will actually, I'll find, come to me. Um, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, I, I like being vegan or this or that. I'm just, I'm just telling you in my experiences, uh, and especially as a Native person, when so many around me in the Native community are, are not vegan, uh, I, have, I do have a few friends that are. So you look at the native community and we uh, have a lot of adornments, feathers, regalia that is uh, animal, right? So uh, I'm sure to a lot of folks that are vegan, that's a little uncomfortable, like, mm, you know, but I have to say that is my culture and maybe some folks may not understand, but what I can tell you and what I can uh, give you out of um, my culture is that um, there is nothing in native culture ever. I do not know of anyone who does not have profound love and respect and prayer for the animals that are involved. And uh, we don't, I don't want you to think I go out. I have an eagle feather that I was gifted uh, from a friend of mine uh, who died and the feather laid across his chest upon uh, his his coffin and his father presented it to me and this was an eagle who had died and we had had the feather so I don't want you to think I'm not running out killing eagles uh, and that's not native culture and and um, but there is that aspect that uh, you know be glad to if anyone has questions I'm gonna do the best I can to answer um, so, um, I will get to these questions that you gave me, Sean, if you, if you like me to, okay. Um, so, uh, Sean, yeah, they would be great. okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. You had, they had given Sean and Ellie and, uh, uh, I forgot the other Kristen. Kristen, Kristen, <clears throat> thank you had sent me some questions beforehand. Um, oh, real quick, before I forget, my hairstyle is called a scalp lock. And yes, I am Mohawk. Uh, this is where it came from. Uh, but I will tell you the or origination of my hairstyle and where it came from. 
Uh, first of all, scalping did not start with native people. It actually started with uh, uh, European colonists who were told to get Indian scalps for a bounty. Bounty hunters actually started that practice. Um, but my scalp lock is here because when we were being hunted for our scalps, uh, men, native men, the Mohawk men, we would shave our heads into different and intricate designs uh, so that the colonists would target the men, would target me, and I could keep the women in my tribe and the children safe. That's where our hairstyles originated from. So this is, again, a, a sen an essence of tradition based upon survival. Um, so uh, let's see. Were there any purely plant-based indigenous communities? You know, I've done a lot of research. Um, I've done a lot of research on pure indigenous-based communities. And the truth of the matter is, I don't know. <laughs> this type of history tends to be lost, you know, and trust me, I have looked and looked and looked. I've interviewed, um, many uh, native folks and ma many native tribal members. And the closest I can tell you is based on talking to sacred oral traditionalists, uh, sacred storytellers, um, sacred genealogists who have passed down stories from generation to generation is um, the closest I've been able to verify is we rarely had meat by many many tribes. It was literally a, a very, very small supplement because, you know, animals were very, very hard to come by. They were wild. You no, know? I mean, yes, they could be caught, but, but uh, for the most part, vegetables are right there, you know, and they were used for medicines, used for, you know, um, healing, first aid types things. Uh, my mother, cut her foot terribly one time and my great grandfather who was a medicine uh had boiled leaves put it on her um on her foot and it had stopped bleeding and and within like a couple of days was healed completely she was like what the heck was <laughs> what did you use uh, i you know but um um let's see were there any describe okay i described my journey through veganism Okay. What are some assumptions, including by vegan communities, you have encountered about people who are indigenous? Is um, I think one of the biggest things I've in, I've encountered as a native man and some of these preconceived stereotypes of indigenous communities is we're not willing to listen if someone's vegan. No, no, forget you. We eat the whole buffalo. I'm not listening to words you say, but that's not the case at all. Um, actually I found, uh, you know, some of my close friends and actually, uh, folks in the community are very open-minded about my discussions and, and, uh, I am not criticized for it in the native community. Really, actually, rarely, if ever, I don't think I've been once criticized in the native community. Actually, I cannot, the top of my head, think of being criticized for my choice. Not one time literally yeah in my life ever and i have told countless countless people and they and I, what i get is well that's great okay that's your that's fantastic really do you feel better well maybe i should try it maybe i should try uh, a little bit better you know um uh, maybe i can do meatless mondays i hear you know sometimes so okay looks like i'm getting questions in the chat so let me open some of these up here oh my gosh you guys are amazing holy moly <laughs> just opened it up i'm like whoa Okay, let's see. <laughs> Jeez, where's the first one, uh, Sean? Where? Okay. Yeah. So, um, let's see. It looks like I was at the Carlisle School. Yeah, no, that is here. a, a proceed on one other. Don't want to tell others how to balance their culture with veganism, but others seem more vocal, quote unquote. What do you recommend as a reliable response to seeking balance that matches ethics and culture? Wow. Thoughtful, <laughs> thoughtful stuff, guys. Well, let me tell you some of the interesting um, situations 
of some of the uh, rural Indian areas, areas that are actually based uh, or close to or lying on the border or border towns of native reservations. And what I can tell you is that um, poor native health in many, many situations is by design. It's made that way by design. Um, as I was telling you guys a couple of days ago, you know, uh, a can of corn or a can of beans can range anywhere from yeah. eight to eleven dollars. Uh, there was a can of asparagus for thirty four dollars. Thirty four dollars for vegetables. So we could want native people to be vegan and maybe you should be healthier and this and that. But the thing is, is, is uh, the availability of a mother who has a couple of children or this or that and has to stretch her money as far as it can go because they are on reservations where there are low amount of jobs and some, some reservation areas like Pine Ridge have the lowest uh, or the highest rates of, uh, of uh, unemployment than just about any place in, in bad conditions and lack of running water to even grow an own, your own garden type of thing. So it's not easy. So um, like I was saying, um, when you are in survival mode, which is in a lot of situations, some, some reservations, some communities, some community members are in survival mode. There are other areas um, that are very viable and they're doing wonderful. They got, they, you know, they're able to do what they have to do and, and um, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're thriving in, in good ways, but there are some communities that are really struggling. So um, practicing empathy and understanding that uh, some of these things are, are in our blood and taught to us from generations and generations back you know, the sacredness of the eagle feather. Uh, the eagle feather is sacred because the eagle itself um, is one of the highest flying birds uh, ever. And we believe the eagle carries uh, prayers to the creator. So that's why we pray to the eagle. Um, but uh, let's see. <laughs> What do, other questions. Yeah, yeah. what what do you think about the dominance of toxic whiteness in some vegan spaces? How do you think these spaces could be more inclusive and effective? Uh, toxic whiteness, huh? In just in vegan spaces? <laughs> I'm a native guy. I get, I get a lot of toxicity sometimes. Um, and in other places, I get a lot of love and and uh, kindness. So, you know, I wish every group was courteous as you guys, but I've been in some pretty, pretty hot situations, you know. Um, and it's interesting because the tough things that I get towards being vegan or being native uh, were not in spaces where there were people of color predominantly, I will say. Um, so there is that. There is that sense of some folks are pretty toxic. And in terms of a dominance of toxic whiteness, you know, that is a really interesting, interesting thing to say because hasn't it been that way since our founding fathers? Hasn't always been that way? So I'll tell you what's exciting about that, that sentiment. What's exciting about that for me now is, is you look at the beginning of our government and the founding fathers and, and the women in this group, you're going to love this story. Okay. So perk up the ears, women. All right. <laughs> I want you to hear this. When the founding fathers were starting their new government, leaving behind the king, saying, we don't want a king anymore. We don't want this dominant patriarchal rule, right? We don't want this king telling us what to do, how he was born into his position and, and you know, barking out orders. We don't want patriarchy, right? That's what they say, right? So what happens, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, 
you know, Alexander Hamilton, what do they do? They meet with my great, 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 great grandfathers, right? The Iroquois Confederacy, Cayuga, Seneca, Onondaga, Mohawk, you know, Oneida, then later the Tuscarora. They meet with the Iroquois leaders, right? And the first thing the Iroquois leaders, by the way, say to the founding fathers is, where's your women? And the founding fathers, of course, laughing, ah, ha, 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 you know. So what happens? So, so the Iroquois Confederacy that Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, all these guys meet up and they see the chiefs, they see the council, they see the, the large mass council. And so what happens? They use our system of government, the Iroquois Confederacy system of government be, to create the House, the Senate, and the Office of the Presidency, right? Trifecta, right? But guess what they left out, women? The Council of Women. And the Council of Women in the Iroquois Confederacy could vote out chief, the number one guy, by themselves, just them, just the Council of Women. Their vote only could remove him without anyone else's decision or anyone else's input. So imagine if we had that government today. So these founding fathers who said we don't like the king just recreated a patriarchy. So I'll tell you the exciting news. I'll tell you the exciting news about this is this patriarchal belief and this patriarchal system that used to be dictated to us as native people, as vegans, as anyone else, are all these things that we've been taught, all these countless, countless hundreds of years, all these things that we've been taught is now being untaught because we have all of these voices here now. So, uh, but, but based upon what I said about the Iroquois Confederacy and the Council of Women, let me ask you something. If we had a Council of Women today, would we still have our chief? <laughs> Uh, so that all said, toxic whiteness is going to be toxic whiteness. It's going to exist. It's going to be there. And you know what? Okay, but I don't got to be there. Iggy Pop said, I choose my company. And I choose my company which is why I'm enjoying talking to you folks here. And what I get to say to that, just to add just a tiny bit more, is this voice of the patriarchy that has been telling us what to think, telling us what to do, telling us what to learn, telling us that everyone in history that has done anything is not a woman and is not a person of color. How much of our history is about white men. No offense to the white men today that are doing great things. That's wonderful. I mean, I'm excited for you. I'm great. I mean, go out there and really do wonderful things. But you mean to tell me everyone in history is is a white dude? Did you know our 31st vice president? Who, who thinks that Kamala Harris is the first vice president of color? Just you don't have to raise your hand, but just in your mind, think, yeah, okay, she's not the first mm -hmm. vice president of color That's right. is the 31st vice president, Charles Curtis, mm -hmm. who was an That's enrolled right. member of the Ka Nation, a Native mm -hmm. American. <laughs> I got a million of them. <laughs> was that Rodney Dangerfield? Yeah, Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> yeah, so, I feel like in so many history books, right, it's just, at least in the history books I was acquainted with growing up, hardly if at all mentioned, mm -hmm. or certainly not emphasized. Exactly, exactly. So you mean to tell me that the, the, the creators of our country are all white, not gay, not, not transgender, not anything other than straight, cis, white, male? I don't buy it. How many people have been written out of history that are just waiting for it. They're just waiting for us to uncover it. And so how I deal with this 
is by having one of a million voices just like you and going right out into social media and going, guess what? I told the true history of Thanksgiving on TikTok post four days ago. It's, it's been viewed 80,000 times in four days. Take that, toxic people. <laughs> you can't silence us anymore. So all of us have a voice. It's there. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I, I will join you arm in arm and go right back out there and tell these toxic people about the real history. And you know what? They're still going to moan and they're still going to complain. But as they're moaning and as they're complaining, the information is going to get out there anyways. And so what's going to happen is their little moaning and crying is going to be drowned out by the people going, aha, with excitement. And the toxic energy is going to continue to fade and fade and fade into the distance. So all we can do is just is just do the best we can to have our strength and our voices and the, our passions uh, together and do amazing stuff together, you know. And that's why, as a journalist and as a social media voice and as as a speaker, I do everything I can to say, you know what, we need to be empowered because I'm tired of this fake narrative I've been taught my whole life. Tired of it. And I wondered why as a kid, I hated history. I couldn't stand it. I hated it. I hated it. I couldn't, st I just literally couldn't listen. And I didn't care. I didn't study. I hated history. And I just thought I was a bad student. But then I become a journalist and I am sucking it up like a sponge. I can't stop when I get to research my history. Just like everyone here is, is so, Here's, here's one thing I, I, I'll, I also like to share because people ask me a lot of the times, why do people, and I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna get too off topic, but, but a lot of people say, well, you know, I love Native Americans. I love Native American culture. You know, why, you know, I wanna be part of that, but I'm not Native. And what I will say is investigate the part of your culture that's been lost because everyone who came to the United States or came to Canada, left behind your culture, whether it's German, Austrian, uh, you know, uh, what, what, what have you, Swiss, and look into your culture because what happened is, is your ancestors left behind this incredible cultural that's rich in, in whatever you had. And then they're faced with people who are in their lands attached to their culture. So of course you're gonna look at that and be like, oh my gosh, that's something I want. So you're going to gravitate to that. But I encourage you to look back. And instead of saying, you know what, I'm white, say, you know what, I am German, Austrian, and Swiss. Because white takes away really what you are. And what you are is beautiful. Every aspect of it, or Irish, or Russian, or what would have, investigate that, look into that, research that, find out the, the little nuances of your culture. And I think that's going to be fulfilling. So... Um, Boy, that took me off on it. <laughs> that question took me. <laughs> I guess I felt passion. <laughs> that was a, such a beautiful answer. I loved it. There's um, there's also a book I, w I wanna recommend related to that. Um, it's called A People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. And it delves into um, uh, indigenous communities and what really happened. And it's, it was so insightful. It's just like all the things that you only heard like a, a tiny, you heard like one tiny bit about that in, in, in you know, your class. And that delves into the actual reality, what really happened. Wow. And it covers, you know, a small segment of American history, but it's such a crucial part. And I'm excited. so- I, That's cool. Yeah, okay. definitely recommend it. I am. Cool. Can you email me that or put it in Absolutely. the chat? Absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah and yeah, I'm going to put it in the chat as well. Thank you both. And okay. then there's an, a, another question. So just oh, I see it. the questions. Yep. Yeah. Given the trauma experienced by indigenous communities in North America, re, uh, removing folks from their land and forcing them to areas that often removed access to fresh food that has harmed the health of Native communities, are there efforts to bring plant cultivation and foraging back more presently to empower communities by increasing access to healthy food. Yes, yes, yes. 
Yes, mm. absolutely. There is now. I don't re- I don't know the names of these organizations off the top of my head, but I've actually done a few stories about, you know, uh, farmers, uh, native farmers, native communities that that work with their local communities in bringing more of these vegetable veg- vegetable foods to their communities, also to you know, local farmers markets, but. Uh, yes, I've done considerable amount of stories. On, yes, that, that is an excellent question. And yes, there are. Uh, there, there are actually even some medical facilities who are working with, well, you know, I mean, things have obviously been shifted because of COVID, you know, and by the way, I pray for all of you to be safe and healthy and, and okay during this wackiness, you know, for sure. But yes, there are. Yes, there are. And what I can do is I can share this with Ellie and, and you guys, uh, I'll look up the article and, and send it to you guys. But yes, thank great you. question. That'd be fabulous. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, That's there awesome. has been. Um, thank you. Another hey, question question. From, there's a question from Amy. Okay. Um, and uh, you can read it if you like, if you want, if you found it already. I can, I'll listen. Sure. I hope I pronounced one of the words correctly. Okay. I, <laughs> I've been told that there are some teachings on veganism within some indigenous cultures, maybe. M I apostrophe K M A Q. Micmac. I've heard random mentions about star teachings. Not mm-hmm. sure if you've heard of those. Yeah, I have heard a little bit about it. Um, and yes, to answer your question, and yes, there are some outreach, and yes, there are, are some efforts. Uh, also, I think uh, the Vis- the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine also worked with uh, Neil Bernard and Igor Newkirk, who met with me in a restaurant here in Virginia, which is really kind of surreal. <laughs> They're like, hey, Vince, come meet with us. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so it's pretty wild. Um, and Igor Newkirk is, of course, the head of PETA. And I, I'm sure some of you have I've heard of Dr. Neil Bernard. Uh, very nice. Uh, we talked about things for a while. Then they did a uh, a uh, effort to Native communities um, uh, through this like DVD that that they've dispersed everywhere about uh, healthier cooking practices and the use of uh, more more vegetable oils than things like lard. And uh, I talked to a lot of people uh, about it, and um, uh, there was some very positive responses. So. I think it's about getting the message out consistently because I do find a lot of people listen. And uh, I was even on an episode of Native America Calling talking about this. Native America Calling is a uh, 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 five days a week Native program that goes on uh, stations across the country uh, talking about veganism. And I got a wonderful response. So, yes, there's been a lot of efforts. uh, And I do think awareness is growing. Uh, quite a bit. And, um, you know, uh, people are saying, you know, I've lost some weight. And, uh, you know, my wife's mother recently went vegan. And uh, she's dropped like, probably 40 pounds, looks fabulous. She says she feels better. And she was taking diabetes medicine three times a day. And the doctor said, well, just once, you know, literally. So, um, you know, definite improvements there and she loves it you know so that's fabulous oh my gosh this thing's moving fast okay (laughs) okay okay okay. there's a question from phil (laughs) okay uh i was if you're following it thank you you go ahead because i feel like i'm getting lost (laughs) oh yeah no worries they'll make we'll make it a little easier for you Uh, okay thank you thank you um phil says to dine at a native american pop-up restaurant called cafe alone in Berkeley, California, that did a great job of mixing history and culture information with great local recipes. The overwhelming majority of the food was vegan. Do you know of any such opportunities within a few hours of Pittsburgh? <sighs> well, you know, my friend, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. I'm just going to be honest with you. I mean, other than a Google search. Um, but, uh, you know, something I like to do is I'll, I'll get a cookbook and there are so many uh, alternatives now. It's like you really, as a, as a vegan, we kind of get the, the sense of, of what to do uh, unless you're brand new and you're just learning, then take, you know, take your time, take, you know, it's, it can be expensive to experiment too much. <laughs> uh, but 
look up some native foods and do the substitute as best you can, because it's, at least for me, I find it's pretty easy to make substitutions now where even five years ago wasn't as easy mm-hmm. it is as, as it is now. Uh, I, I still am a little more cautious with, with making sure that the things I have are organic and that's, that's my personal choice. It's not, and it's not always possible for everyone. And that, that's certainly understandable. You do the best you can, you do the best you can, but if you want to have something like, um, you know, the stereotypical Indian taco, you can, um, get some tortillas and uh impossible burger and you know lettuce tomato and some beans on there um but the thing is is a lot of the a lot of those um substitute meats are not organic and and that's like i said only my choice but so but one of my favorite things to do and it feels so native and it's the easiest thing is just warm up some corn tortillas warm up some beans and some lettuce hot sauce i'm done (laughs) <laughs> I'm happy. I'm just done to it. <laughs> and that's very, okay. very nice. corn beans, you know. So yeah. Yeah, um, that makes sense. That's awesome. Another question. Thank you so much, Vincent. It's such a great experience. I'm glad what's another question? Yeah, in the chat. What's the top thing that you'd like to see white vegans do to better support native vegans and vegans living within those populations? Well, like I said, I think it's, it's not always possible. You know, it's not always possible. And, um, you know, I don't want to pick on white vegans. You know, I, I think that, um, I think that, uh, it could be any type of vegan who might, um, be judgmental. You know, and I think something that we as vegan people um, can can work on as best we can is, you know, we have a lot of love to give. We've made a severe, at least according to most of society, severe decision in comparison and contrast to what other society does. And the decision we have made is based upon in many ways, not just health, but our undying love for animals. You know, I I see a dog and I melt. I'm just like, I want to just lay on the floor and hug them. You know, I'm just, that's how I am. I'm just like a total goofball or a cat that's cute. I'm I'm done. I'm I'm done. You know, I I could be a turtle or whatever. I'm just, (laughs) you know, I'm done. I love, and I mean, I love animals so much. I I am the weird neighbor that goes out and talks to the geese and I can tell them apart. (laughs) People are like, I know people are like, there's the weird neighbor Vince. There he is again, walking outside, you know, and I will literally talk about them and talk to them and talk to a cat. And I was sitting down one time reading and a goose literally walks by and like brushes by my leg and just walks by while they attack all the other neighbors. My neighbor's like, he's walking by you, not doing anything. I was like, I was like, that's just, you know, I, I'm not a threat. I love them. So, so that said, in native culture, in my Mohawk culture and in many other native cultures, uh, we, I'll see very, look at the dog in the zoom. <laughs> so, um, in native culture, when we give prayer, uh, we give thanks, uh, for, for, for example, the Iroquois Confederacy that has a prayer of thanks that can last three days. And in that prayer of thanks, we thank, you know, the trees, the earth, the grass, the four-legged creatures, the winged creatures, you know, all animals, all people, all colors, all men, all women, all children. So if you take the love that you have for all creatures, if you think we equate animals as our brothers and our sisters, and they are sentient beings as we are. So if we take that love that we have for animals, 
we should have and practice that same love to our fellow man. If we're tolerant to an animal who may go to the bathroom on the carpet without realizing it will be tolerant, but may, we might be. So uh, as a vegan, are we more tolerant of an animal than we are our fellow man? Shouldn't we be giving that same sort of love to our fellow man or fellow woman as we do? So my thought where people can be a little bit rough is to have empathy and realize that not everyone is on your path and love them anyway. I'm not saying we have to lie down and get kicked by someone and say, I love you for treating me terrible. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when we can afford the courtesy and we can afford empathy for understanding that someone is not on our path they will do much better to be taught by you portraying something in a positive way as opposed to trying to enforce something. There's a story of the sun and the moon having an argument. No, sorry, take that back. Sorry, this is a different story. Uh, a cloud and the sun make a bet with each other. And the cloud says, I can take that jacket off that man. The sun says, okay. So he blows and blows and blows and blows in the wind. And the higher the wind gets, the, the tighter the man holds his jacket. No matter how hard he tries, the man just really hunkers down and hunkers down. And the sun goes, you're done. And the wind goes, yeah. And the sun just goes, and the guy goes, ah and makes the decision to take off the jacket. So it's not about forcing something. It's about existing and being present and do, doing something in your life that make people want to make their own decisions. That's the best for them. And that doesn't mean we know what's best for them either, but it does allow them to make their own decision. I totally agree. That is super moving. Wow, thank you. Sure. And thanks for everyone. <laughs> I'm not even yeah. sure what I said. <laughs> it moved me, yeah. <laughs> and it's nice that other other beings are joining us as well, you know, in the Zoom. Oh, um, no. so dogs sweet. and other creatures too, so that's great too. Love it. And there's another question from Ellie about okay. any classic indigenous um, vegan meals, vegan recipes. You know, uh, I, I love uh, just corn beans and squash it's it's simple but it, it's and it's not only that it's a perfect protein <laughs> it's just it's just amazing and and you know there are um there are different types of squash soup which you can put some uh just take some uh vegetable broth uh, a little bit of like oat milk a little bit of of, of squash cook it Add just a little bit of seasoning. Little, I love cumin personally. A little bit of sea salt, a little bit of pepper, and just get one of those mixing things and just blend it. Oh my gosh! So um, there is acorn squash soup. There are you know tortilla, corn tortillas, things like that that I love. Um, you know, I, I know there's like a million more, but um, you know, I just really love. You know, there there is something that that's really popular at powwows called Indian tacos, uh, which is generally, uh, it does have meat and cheese on it, but let's make our vegan style. You know what I'm saying? You can put chop. Personally, I love to, to thinly chop tofu or crumble it, put a little bit of soy sauce, mix some beans in it, lettuce, tomato, put it on a nice big fat tortilla. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. That sounds awesome. Yeah, wow. oh my God, I'm hungry now. <laughs> I know I can, I'm getting hungry. Too. I can even show you. I can. Okay, here's what I can do. I can't. I do have the article. I can show you the picture of the two things. So that's the one thing I did want to share. So I'll show you the photo. Okay, okay. Okay, here it is. Native. Okay, so here is. All right, I'll share my screen. I don't know if I can actually. You have to. You have to allow me to share the screen. Um, uh, okay. Just technically sure. So well, yeah, I just did the screen share. Uh, 
Well, what I can do is just hold it up. <laughs> oh, you did give me screen share? Okay. Oh, there. Okay. There we go. Okay. Here we go. All right. And share. Okay. So you guys can see my screen now. Here's my Native American um, and vegan. Hey. Yeah. This is an article I wrote a couple of years, years ago. I'm going to move this and uh, talk about being a vegan. What the heck is a vegan? There's a buddy of mine. Um, so here are some of the things I eat. Beans and rice burrito with salsa guacamole, pasta, tomato sauce. So here's yum. <laughs> that is tofu, a little bit of bean, some, some uh, uh, nice penne pasta, a little bit of broccoli, and I love this. So I just take tofu literally. Oh, here, I, can, I forgot I can do this. Here's me. So I literally just take this tofu, crumble it, pour tomato sauce on it, just let it simmer for a while, and it turns into this really wonderful meaty type of uh, uh, kind of like a, I, I don't know what you call it, just a very, very thick, wonderful tomato sauce with tofu in it. It's fantastic. I just personally love it. Crumble it up. You know the best type of tofu? Who, anybody agree with me here? Wild wood. Anybody else agree? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Oh my gosh, no, nobody can beat it. You know, that's a commune that makes that. So here's my, my uh, bean tacos. How simple is this? Little refried beans, lettuce, tomato, you know, so yum. All right, so that's just at least, I just wanted to show you at least two photos I had up there. <laughs> Thank you. Can you share the link um, to the article? Sure, absolutely. Here you go. Thanks. <laughs> There's another question um, when you're ready mm -hmm. from Amy. Have you looked up Ed Winters, also known as Earthling Ed? And if so, what do you think of his talks and messages? Oh, no, sadly, I'm sorry. Uh, that sounds like a great question. Ed, Ed Winters, no. Earthling Ed? Mm -hmm. No, let me... Uh, is, he, is he like on the vegan circuit now or something? Uh, I have not... Director of yeah, Surge and Rice Organization. Okay, no, I'm yeah, not familiar with him, utility. but I'll look him up. Mm -hmm. He looks yeah, like a cool right. dude. <laughs> 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 looks like Jesus, kind of. <laughs> yeah. yeah, being an activator. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that in terms of that nickname for him. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I know he's done a lot, like, of, and a lot's been online on YouTube of where he, maybe pre pandemic especially, mm -hmm. would talk to folks in the street and try to have compassionate conversations, you know, while still, um, you know, being assertive um, and had gone to different universities and colleges, including within the U S to have similar tours and conversations. Okay. What kind of reception does he get when he, from people when he's doing these interviews? So from what I've seen, and I haven't seen it all, it's, it's been layered. Um, <laughs> and yeah, at least from my sense, but for other folks who may be even more familiar, feel free to share, but yeah, it's, it's, it feels like it's a mix. Okay. Well, he in looks terms of people check him out. To him, yeah. Okay. Um, and I appreciate what he said. Yeah. I highly recommend him. Um, okay. Amy was saying I highly recommend him. He uses a Socratic. Yeah. It's a great form of questioning when having conversations and has a few TED talks. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. I, I, think, I think that's yeah. the questions now. I think I'm got them all. I'm just making sure I didn't miss I any think from you guys. So from what I'm gathering. And yes. Okay. So I guess what I can yeah. do is cl my closing, I guess, um, yeah. uh, which I don't really have anything specific to say other than uh, how much I appreciate you guys. You know, thank you mm. so much for uh, asking me and inviting me and, I feel very honored that you would um, ask me to uh, speak about this uh, during Native American Heritage Month. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's um, something that's really important to me. I love to share of my culture. I love to share of um, being Mohawk and uh, talking about the Iroquois Confederacy. I, okay, I know I have a funny story. Since we're in a group that loves animals, I will tell you how I got my Native name. Mm. of Black Raven, who, by the way, I, I'll tell the, yeah, okay, that, that's how we'll, I will end, I will end on my Black Raven story, because it's actually kind of hilarious. <laughs> so, 
Um, I was in Aquasasne, on my reserve, yeah, just outside of New York and right on the border of Canada. And I kept seeing ravens all day. So I met with my Dota, her name was Carol Ross. And Dota is actually uh, how the Mohawk language works is it means grandmother, but it's kind of also means grandmotherly type figure. Uh, it could be a woman who treats you grandmotherly or someone who you look at as a grandmother. It could be that, you know, English is the least expressive language in the world, actually. So we have, you know, one word that can mean so much. But so my Dota, Carol Ross, uh, was the Mohawk's language instructor in Aquasasne. And she says, Joe Glees. Well, she says, Vincent. Sorry, she didn't call me that yet because I don't have the name yet. She says, Vincent, you need a Mohawk name. You're here, you're, you're practicing with your community. You need to get a Mohawk name. And I, she, so we talked about it for a while. It was a couple of days that were like, as I was doing a film for the, the, the tribe and, you know, they, they said, I think your name should be one more thing. Cause I'm always like, Oh wait, one more thing. Oh wait, one more thing. They were like, they were telling me that should be my name. And, uh, but she, she looked at me and she says, I'm trying to think I'm trying to. And I was like, and I was like, God, you know, I keep seeing these uh, black ravens everywhere. She goes, that's it. That's your name. Black Raven. Yes. That, Cause she had been seeing them too. And I was like, oh yeah, Black Raven, that's bad A bleep. You know, I was like, yeah, that's bad A, you know, yeah. Oh man, that's a tough name, yeah, Black Raven. I was like <laughs> thinking of like a big Black Raven tattoo on my chest. You know, I'm, my mind's already going there. You know, I'm like, I'm like tough guy, Black Raven. She goes, I go, yeah, that's awesome name. Delta, how'd you come up? And she goes, she goes, well, don't get too excited. I called you Black Raven because they're really loud and they get on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, oh, that. I was like grandma <laughs> that is awesome so that was my name but uh one really cool thing that did happen is i uh was driving back to my hotel and i'm also wolf clan and i look at the wolf clan sign as i'm pulling in and a black raven lands on it right after getting my name wow yeah That's and then for the whole rest of the trip home hundreds and i'm not kidding you hundreds of black ravens kept landing on either side of the road my whole drive back to virginia my wife's like okay even i'm kind of noticing it was weird so you know it's pretty wild i've had ravens come up knock on my window stand stand out here on my ledge on my rail um they're incredibly intelligent animals so that was a cool story of my name but i just really want to say um thank you so much for inviting me and I, how much i really appreciate you guys taking some time to listen and oh i saw the kitty <laughs> yeah oh hello <laughs> kitty, oh, I'm, pet I'm petting the kitty <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. i just want to no, say great. thank you thank you for having me yeah really thank me. you vincent a heartfelt thank you from us all and there's a lot of great thank yous in the um chat as well amy had and others had asked about social media handles for yourself oh yeah okay i if you want to turn the time yes uh, it's, so it's Vince Schilling at V I N C Vince Schilling and Schilling is S C H I L I N G Vince Schilling V I N C E Schilling. So that's on Twitter. I'm Vince Schilling on Twitter, Vince Schilling on Instagram, Vince Schilling on TikTok. But I'm telling you, I'm really loving TikTok. Wow, I'm just having a blast. <laughs> I'm just, I really, just really enjoy it. I'm really, in, it's really. I'll put the actual link in there. But uh, wow, I'd be honored if you guys followed me. I thank you so much. That'd be wonderful. Of course. And we want to thank um, Humane Action Pittsburgh. Uh, Rachel, thank you so much. Natalie, Vice President, Brian President, Taylor, thank you so much. And everyone else at HAP who's been involved in making tonight possible. Really appreciate it. Um, Rachel put some links about HAP in the chat as well to learn more about their awesome and impactful work. And Ellie, Chris, and I, um, three co-organizers from Pittsburgh Beacon Society, we want to thank everyone for attending today, too, and for your great questions and thoughtful comments. Um, and Vincent, just thank you so much again. We hope to keep up the communication and collaboration. And I'll put um, the TikTok in the chat, too. <laughs> I just put them for you. I put them for you. I put the TikTok and the Twitter. Um, Oh, awesome. So you guys can feel free to share. Oh, wait, I think I put it to, sh I, it I think I put it to maybe. you. Okay. I, I just I put it to it. you, Sean. I'll try to do it. Can you put it to everyone? Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, you put my YouTube. Um, in. God, you guys are great. Thank you. Oh, wow. 
Mays. Jeez, the week. You guys are me. You better than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, guys. Um, you know, I uh, will um, tell you that, um, you know, uh, my family, uh, my great great grandfathers and grandfathers were medicine. So I have medicine and healing in in my family. And, um, you know, so I'm uh, sending some healing energy your way. You know, so please allow me to offer this to you. I really, really mean this very strongly. I'm pl placing some very strong energy out there. So if you need healing in any way, I am offering it to you. You are absolutely welcome to accept it if you like it. Okay. Healing and protection. So. Wow, my hands are hot. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean that sincerely. That's that's for you folks. Yeah, I, no, no. I give that gift to you. I hope you have a wonderful holidays. I hope you all stay safe. Um, yeah. Please know that uh, Native American, I don't celebrate Thanksgiving. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but it's okay if you wish me happy thanks. And so perfectly okay. <laughs> I, I'm not offended by it, but uh, uh, I appreciate you all. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really genuinely mean that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you you're so, so welcome take good care of it. yeah and sending healing energy to everyone as well thank, thank you Vincent for sharing it with us thank you take the yeah back too <laughs> yeah go for it please okay folks well thank you so much I am uh, going to uh, go have a vegan meal <laughs> go enjoy enjoy thank so enjoy bye, thanks everyone. everyone take good care bye bye everyone wonderful meeting you if you Follow me on social yeah. media. I'll follow you back. Awesome. We'll do. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Be safe and be well, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.